I want to welcome back Virginia Postrel. She's been with us this week and will join us again tomorrow night. Tonight, we look at the importance of how and why we put some people, possessions, and lifestyles on a pedestal. Virginia, hi again. Hi. This is a really interesting topic. We're going to talk about glamour tonight. I can't, my eyes are going to have to light up when I say <laughs> that word. Um, but we're not going to talk about it perhaps in the traditional sense. So I want to start off uh, with asking you, what does glamour, when you hear that word, what does it mean to you? Well, what it means to me is not necessarily what, uh, what it means to the general public. A lot of people think of glamour, they think of Hollywood, uh, fashion. Those are the two, uh, maybe makeup, <laughs> the, the sort of thing. There. But in fact, uh, glamour is much deeper and broader than that. It helps to go back to the original meaning of the word. It was an old Scottish word. First of all, sometimes people think it's, it's French. French. Yeah, it's not French. Glamour. No, it was a, <laughs> it was a Scottish word, uh, and it meant a literal. It was a, a word for a literal kind of magic spell. Yeah. It literally cast a spell, made you see something uh, that different from what was there. Usually, something that was better than what was there. And it still has a little bit of that meaning today. Glamour is an illusion. Uh, it is a form of persuasion, nonverbal persuasion. And it, what it does is it takes uh, an idea or an image that fo it focuses people's, the audience's inchoate desires, whatever that, those desires might be, to be beautiful, to be popular, to be admired, to be respected, to be manly, to, uh, to have union with God, to uh, go down in history. It could be anything. Um, any kind of desire can be focused uh, through glamour, it gives you a sense of uh, that this is attainable, and in this process, there are always three ingredients. There is always a sense, a promise of escape or transformation. Uh, if you only could be different and be transformed in some way or be in a different setting, you could have whatever it is that you desire. And there is a sense of grace. Uh, certain things are emphasized, certain things are hidden. Uh, things look effortless is a word you often hear in conjunction with glamour. And there is always mystery. You don't see everything. That's partly makes the grace, the illusion work, but it also is intriguing. And you think about intrigue and intriguing uh, being related words. Those are the ingredients yeah. that we need for glamour. Right. But why do we need glamour uh, as the person who's creating it or the idea that's right. creating and as a recipient. Why do we need it? Well, first of all, glamour is like humor. Uh, sometimes somebody just says something and it's funny. And, you know, glamour is like humor. It's created between an audience and an object. So sometimes it's spontaneous. You just find something glamorous. Nobody designed it with you, that in mind, but it just resonates with you. Other times, just as there are people who are comedy writers, uh, glamour is constructed. People want to have a certain effect on an audience and they try to construct glamour. Now, whether it works or not depends on the audience, depends on the audience's receptivity, uh, its willingness to suspend disbelief, its desires, uh, its cultural context, something that was glamorous 50 years ago or 100 years ago might not be glamorous today. So why do people want it? Well, first of all, as individuals, as the audience, they say, um, first of all, it's just fun. It's enjoyable. It's a, it's a form of escapism uh, in the positive sense. Uh, it allows a break from the everyday. It allows you to envision your ideals fulfilled. Um, so that's the sort of entertainment value of it. There's also an inspiration value of it. Uh, it can move you to action. It can, uh, even though it's illusory, it can put a goal in front of you that becomes valuable in your life, um, or potentially not valuable, depending on what it is. Uh, uh, there is also the question of, is glamour good or evil? And I would argue that it's neither. It's, it's a form of nonverbal rhetoric, and like any form of rhetoric, it can be used for good or ill, uh, any form of persuasion. I want to talk about glamour in places we don't traditionally look right. or think we find glamour. And, and one of the areas you write about a lot, or have written about a lot, was about Obama's presidential bid right. in 2008. Right. How is that glamorous? Well, 
In politics, it's very common to have charismatic uh, politicians. Bill Clinton, for example, was very charismatic. And a charismatic figure is somebody who uh, draws you in uh, and in a way where you identify with them and it's a force of personality. Uh, and it's a characteristic of that person in the same way that somebody uh, could be athletic or uh, something. Glamour is different. Glamour is really created in the audience's mind, although in the Obama campaign they enhanced it with certain kinds of imagery. And what happened in 2008 is a large, I was going to say the American people, but obviously there were people who were, didn't like Obama, but a large group of people, not only in the U.S., but actually around the world, looked at Barack Obama and they, they projected their own hopes and dreams uh, of what not only they wanted in a president, but what they wanted in a country onto this figure. And he was very graceful. Uh, actually, he's physically graceful, but he's also well-spoken, intelligent, uh, politically adept. Uh, he's good-looking, all of those sorts of things. Uh, but he's also a little mysterious. His background is very unusual. It's not the typical, uh, it's, it's, it's not just that he's black. He doesn't have a typical African-American yeah. background. I mean, it literally, it's African-American. Yeah. That's uh, already, he's, um, he, he grew up in Hawaii and in Indonesia, these sort of exotic places that have a kind of glamor to them. Um, and, and he's also a very self-contained individual, which is a term that you will often hear applied to glamorous individuals, uh, that they, they have a kind of, uh, they keep their own counsel in a way, which is not to say they aren't friendly. Obviously, a politician has got to be somebody who can connect with voters. But the kind of connection is a different kind of connection from a charismatic connection. It's a, it's a connection of the person, the audience projecting onto you what it is that they desire. Now, the problem is then you're successful. You yeah. get elected president, and you have to make choices. And some of those, if all of these disparate people who have different hopes and dreams and ideals have projected onto you that you represent their, their views, some of them are not going to like the choices that so you So he's choose. no longer glamorous? Well, I would say he is a lot less glamorous than he was. I wouldn't say he's not he's lost it completely or he's lost it for every audience, but a lot less both in the US and around the world. You know, it's interesting about that is that I think societally we tend to want to shatter this glamorous image that we have or that we make of politicians. What what's behind that it, desire? It's not just politicians, it's in general. Uh, there are a couple of impulses uh, behind that. First of all, you know, we know it's an illusion, and there's always that debunking impulse. You know, tell me about this movie star is not really living the great life. Look, let's, let's look more closely. And then there's also the, even people who admire whatever it is that's glamorous, they look more more closely and then it just becomes familiar it starts to lack the distance so so for example you always dreamed of going to venice it seemed like the perfect ideal vacation spot you go to venice maybe you like venice but you start to notice the parts that weren't on the picture postcard uh, whether it's the baggage, you know, they lose your luggage on the way to your trip, or, or whether it's uh, somebody said uh, to me that, you know, Venice is glamorous until you smell the smell of rotten fish, and then it's like Hoboken, which is <laughs> New Jersey, outside New York, <laughs> and with better architecture. You know, th so there's this tendency, because glamour is an illusion that depends on distance and depends on hiding flaws, there, it, it tends to be very fragile, whether it's in politicians or in any other manifestation. Well, we seem to have a desire to want to break it, to shatter glamour. What's behind that? Well, you know, we, we want to know. We want to know the truth. Uh, we enjoy the illusion, but we want to know the truth. And whether it is active debunking or whether it's just I just love this movie star so much. I want to know every single thing about them. And then I find out the stuff that's not so glamorous, even if it's not terrible. We shatter the illusion. And then we're on to the next thing, sometimes. 
According to your research, Virginia, glamour resides more than just in idealized people. You've talked about their lifestyles. It exists in somewhere where I never thought we would find a glamour, which is technology. Uh, and I want to read an excerpt from an article you wrote for the Wall Street Journal when you wrote for them this past November. Here's what you wrote. Policy wonks assume the current rage for wind farms and high-speed rail has something to do with efficiently reducing carbon emissions. So they debate load mismatches and ridership figures. These are worthy discussions and address real questions, but they miss the emotional point. To their most ardent advocates and increasingly to the public at large, these technologies aren't just about generating electricity or getting from one city to another. They are symbols of an ideal world longing disguised as problem solving. You can't counter glamour with statistics. What do wind farms and high-speed rail have anything in common with glamorous figures, people like Obama or Angelina Jolie? Make the connection. Well, it's, 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 well, let's first of all talk about what they have in common with an earlier technology. If you go back to the mid-20th mid century, another period of a lot of technological ferment and technological glamour, you find little pictures of rocket ships and airplanes and sometimes even atoms on all kinds of weird things that have nothing to do with the technologies direct, uh, directly because these symbols evoked a certain hope for the technological future. And technology, I mean, I'm a technophile. I'm I believe in technological progress, but there is often, it often comes at, wrapped in a kind of glamour uh, where it promises not just to get the job done, whatever the job might be, but to transform your life, your hope, your society, the world. And what's happened with windmills and high speed rail is, first of all, windmills show up in really bizarre places. Not, it, it's not as pervasive. They haven't shown up to my knowledge on wallpaper yet. But, but uh, people putting them on wedding rings. They are the, they're, they're advertising, putting them on ads for things. That Al Aveda had ads for uh, skincare products that had windmills. Uh, the, the MIT uh, Sloan School of Management advertises their executive MBA programs with windmills. Uh, they're not about running windmills, you know, it's, it's, but it just represents sort of the clean, technologically advanced, better future. And you're not supposed to ask all those wonky questions that I, that I uh, raise. So for example, in California where I live, we now have this sort of high-speed rail kind of disaster, actually. It's, it's a train to nowhere. Um, in California, we're, we had the experience of selling freeways with lots of glamour, that in the future, there would be like all these tremendous roads, and you'd be able to drive anywhere, but there would be no traffic. And of course, we, that is a problem. But uh, with high-speed rail, it's this notion that we're going to spend all this money and get people out of their cars. Um, but somehow it's not going to disrupt people's land um, and everybody assumes that the other people are going to ride it. The numbers don't work out very well, but even when you see uh, an article about how this is a bad thing, it will be illustrated with this beautiful, sleek train that is as, as glamorized as anybody on a red carpet, just moving through the scenery with such grace that you can't help but project yourself into it and you want, you want to live in that world. And that is what glamour is about. It's about showing you an image that takes whatever it is you're desiring. In this case, people want clean, they want to get out of the traffic, they want, uh, if it, they want to have the benefits of, to, of, of energy production without the cost. You want to live in that world. It shows you that image. It has grace. It has mystery. And you project yourself there. But if we're talking about a wind turbine or even about light rail transit, I mean, it might be glamorous to, to certain people who identify right, with right. that or find it right. glamorous or care about what that kind of image represents. But there are others that won't. So how much does glamour uh, really, how much is it really an expression of our individual needs and tastes? It's very much in the audience. Uh, you know, there are people, I mean, we talked earlier about Obama. I mean, obviously, there are people who hate Obama. And in fact, 
uh, take it to such an extent that they interpret the mystery as being hiding something not just ordinary, like he's an ordinary politician, but something terrible. Uh, and that is the real flip side of glamour. Sometimes it can turn into horror. Um, so that people who don't like wind turbines will say, look at all these dead birds, hmm. and they'll show you carcasses of dead birds to try Not to turn glamorous. the glamour into horror. Um, so so there is glamour definitely, it's just like humor in this respect. The audience has to be receptive to it, or it does not work. Uh, it doesn't matter how beautifully you think you've crafted it. If it doesn't resonate with the audience, it doesn't work. And if the audience changes, uh, something that was very glamorous at one time uh, might not be glamorous. In, you know, smoking used to be incredibly glamorous. Uh, then it became, you know, that filthy habit that kills people. Uh, now there's, among a certain population, there's a little bit of glamour that it's sort of re rebel glamour. But that's very mm. different from the, uh, the early movies kind of smoking glamour. Okay, Virginia Postrel, we'll have to leave it here for tonight, but you'll be back again tomorrow. We'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you.